Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, we are really glad to have you here for the week two webinar on data security. Thank you so much for making the time to join today, um, where we will have a guest speaker take us through some of the data security best practices and just a few housekeeping directions. Uh, please, if you do have questions, make sure to uh, use the Q&A section of Zoom so that we're able to get to your question as quickly as possible um, because it can get lost within the chat. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of responses there of you telling us where you're joining us from and we're very excited to have you here. So please use the Q&A section and we'll be able to answer your question live or we will um or we'll answer it due, um by typing it on the by typing it on the on the q a section itself so if you do have a question and you've asked it there please also check to see whether it's been answered by one of our facilitators and today i have the honor of introducing our guest speaker who is going to uh, take us through data security and complement some of the content that you've interacted with uh, during week two. And our guest speaker today is uh, Mr. Bethel Chitala, who is an innovative cybersecurity analyst, um, currently working as a risk advisory consultant at Deloitte. He has handled various engagements in, in cybersecurity domains such as data privacy assessment, vulnerability and threat assessment, and cyber governance. He has, facilitated, he has facilitated various cybersecurity training sessions for boards, senior management, and different end, end users. Uh, so without much further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Bethwell. Thank you for that, Patricia. That was such a wonderful introduction. I'll keep that in mind for my future introductions. So, hi everyone. Welcome. As you've heard, my name is Bethwell, and it's such a pleasure to have you all here. From the chat, I can see everyone uh, from everywhere, from Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda. So I'm just grateful to be here with you. And so, yeah, without further ado, let's start. I'll just quickly share my screen. So yeah, today's topic has said it will focus more on data security. Yes, this is a key component in our day-to-day -day lives. And we hope as educators to be able to secure the data of all the all the data we handle and people so that people can trust us, whether it is guardians, institutions, and everyone, the society at large. So we'll just start firstly with seeing the data security stakeholders. Now for this, as for in this and in an ed educational point of view, it will be divided into three people. It will be the teachers, the students, and the non-teaching staff. Now the non-teaching staff are the people like the cooks, could be the cleaners, your janitors, and people from the procurement team, all that. Students, of course, the learning personnel, then the teachers, the educators. Now, in the data security, teachers have the main stakeholder to protect the data. Basically, they will lead the way in data security and uh, be the beacon which people will follow. Then there will be the students. The students will work under the supervision from the guardians and the teachers. So basically, the students take the lead from the teachers and also and their educators and also the guardians and the non-teaching staff will also learn a lot from the teachers and also take the cues from the teachers so basically just seeing the teaching staff uh, they are the ones in an educational system who lead the way in the data security now data security in itself we first need to know before talking about data security we first need to know about data. What is data? Yeah. So basically, what I can describe data is, is 
data is anything basically information that you have which can be processed so data can vary from a lot of things and i was um i can just hope in the chat you can provide me some sort of some forms or examples of data which you've interacted with i'll give you an example in a classroom data can be something like report cards that is data yeah examination questions and answers that is also data student names so if you can just give any examples just type them down in the chat yeah student details worksheets yes that is gupta student names assignments yeah very good very good question papers student personal information grades yeah so i can see you understand those are the data points for everyone uh, in, a, in a classroom set, uh, point of view so just which you've listed them uh, and just place them here so yeah there are the report cards the course curriculum examination questions and answers yeah all those things you've mentioned in the chats the attendance list notes student details all that that is data now for this session we need to know how to secure this data okay so now that is now where data security comes in right now data security i can just classify it simply to basically four aspects the first aspect is the physical security then the operational security digital security and the administrative security now these are generally the four broad areas where data where how we can classify the data security okay or how we can secure data now just a brief introduction into them for the physical security the first one this basically refers to what we do uh, the physical aspect of the security which involves the physical interaction which will go deeper into that the operational security involves the day-to-day -day operations or routines and how we can secure data from their in their routines now the digital security which will be the main focus of today because that poses the most risk uh, involves the electronic aspect or the digital aspect basically anything that is on the computer and or in the machines will involve the digital security and the administrative security basically this means the leadership how leadership can secure the data through policies and administrative roles so let's go into this the first one physical security now as we had said it is using the physical interaction how can we secure the physical uh, data first and foremost this is simple if you have physical data like maybe report cards or books assignments cards some of you in the universities you can store you store them in a physical cabinet so you make sure it is important to lock the cabinet of course to uh, and that lock you have the key so it restricts access to who can access the locks yeah then secondly it is we can shred the paper records basically that means that once you are done with data yeah which is physical data you can move to shred them so that people can't access them and use those data maliciously you know you never know you can maybe have the student names and their phone numbers and their emails and you think that paper you just fold it and throw it in the dustbin but someone comes takes it uses those uh, contact details to target them uh, now the next part can also be the implementing access control basically access control is monitoring who can access places with your data so you can use locks and keys or you can use video surveillance that is cctv to monitor who comes in and who goes and also you can use maybe key cards or biometrics for those institutions which are advanced can secure those are really secure measures to implement access control then further, finally you can hire security personnel 
basically the security personnel will be the watchmen the like watchmen or watch people who guard the like the staff rooms or the areas where the educators keep their data so that no one can access them yeah that's on physical security I hope you've understood that the next part will be on the operational security now as i had said earlier the operational security is basically the day to day basically routines what you do from now between classes during classes basically that is the operational security now we need to secure that process that routine now first and foremost you need to foster a culture of security now what does this mean it means you should practice this on a day to day not just have one talk or one webinar then you feel like you are secure no if someone leaves their passwords written on a notebook or something passwords maybe to their laptops which would have student data or something like that you need to advise them no 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 we don't do this we use maybe a password manager to store data so that people cannot access it now for the operation security you will have also the messages on the screen login screens say you are logging into a course material yeah before people log in you can just place their message to foster the security and enhance awareness then further to this you can provide training training could be in house or external this will be mainly just train the students the teachers also the non teaching staff basically on how to have like how to foster security data security yeah so like you can just train them mainly if it is in house it should be someone who is knowledgeable in the aspects for like data security how maybe for the password you should install them outside in terms of your machines you should always lock them secure the files and all that we'll deep, go deep into that then you can also monitor workstations workstations simply refers to the computers basically could be those in the library and which students can access maybe for their own research or maybe the ones the teachers use to store their personal data and the student data so basically you just need to monitor to make sure there are security features yeah to prevent people from using malicious sites malicious sites hackers can use them to access the computer and steal the data and if, then where will we be we'll be all, of course in deep trouble <laughs> yeah then further move on the operational security it will be the implementing the onboarding and exit procedures now what does this mean the onboarding and exit procedures this will be for the teaching and non teaching staff basically the people who work in an education institution now the onboarding when someone new you have a new teacher a math teacher just fresh into your institution when you are onboarding them you need to show them like this is what we do this is how it happens this is how we secure and we take data security seriously you give them access if it is locks and keys to specific secure locations yeah that is it and during the exit procedures you make sure that if someone is leaving you make sure you revoke access to the privileges they had so such that someone cannot leave an institution let's say i was an i was a swahili teacher or an english teacher today then i found a better opportunity went to another school two weeks later i come back to the school and i can still access the staff room with logs that i still have and all that so we just need to implement that and make sure we are on top of that but this will go mainly for the yeah for the educators and the people in the in charge to make sure these are policies which are met yeah then on the third aspect will be the administrative security which ties which is closely related to the operational security now for the administrative security what does this mean this will basically be the people in the position of leadership the heads of institutions heads of departments yeah 
even the normal teachers, you're also leaders in such a way, but mainly we're looking at the administrative part. part. Now, for this, you need to provide your leadership using awareness and training sessions. Basically, this will, if you create regular training sessions, you will enable people to at least know what is expected of them, what they need to do, and all that. Then also, you need to plan around security. You know, you just assume, you can't just assume like, yeah, people are secure, so you saw that. You need to be active, proactive, so, uh, creating meetings, uh, working together with external security personnel to see, do I, do, is everything secure? What can we do to better our security? and all that then drafting privacy and information security policies now for this they're just policies you know it's not enough to just say them if you have policies these are or guidelines basically this is something people can refer to on a day to day at least if they've forgotten they can just say okay what does the policy say for this getting cyber security insurance in case the data is stolen or compromised they should have insurance ready, conducting due diligence for the third parties. Basically, this means that every third party that you interact with, be it the, the Wi-Fi vendors coming to install Wi-Fi in your institution, the people who supply you with your computers and all that, make sure you do your due diligence and your background checks to make sure these are reputable vendors and this is what they are going to do is exactly what they're going to do and not more. Yeah, this will mainly help in protecting the data. You see, if you have a Wi-Fi vendor who is unscrupulous, they can install the Wi-Fi, get into your network, then steal the data and we can't have that. So basically, you just need for the administration to be vigilant on that. Then also implementing audit controls. Basically, this means that you need to test your systems and your failures now and then to make sure that whatever measures you've put in place they're actually are they actually working are they working as intended yeah so yeah and making business continuity arrangements basically i know this sounds <laughs> a bit long and hard but business continuity arrangements this means that in the event that let's say there's a power outage or data is lost or something is compromised how can business continue will learning stop or we need will it continue so yeah basically that's what's there so in case maybe data is lost there are secure backups maybe on the cloud or in a secure location where people can use generators so that power is not down so data is not lost and all that that basically means business continuity arrangements but yeah, we can go, you can just, in the meetings, you will go deeper into that. Now, for the main part of this, it will be the digital security. Now, as we had said earlier, the digital security, this refers mainly to the digital aspect, the electronic aspect of security. Everything we have, especially after COVID, is digital. Right now, if you're taking mini meetings, classes, you'll find that most of these people, they're using like online tools to facilitate this. And their data is in computers and all that. So how can we secure this data? First of all, the documents, say the data which we spoke of earlier, the examination results, the report cards, course material. We need to secure these documents with a password. How can we do this? We can use tools such as Foxit, which can encrypt. Encrypt is just putting the password in the document, which can encrypt the documents, making sure that only the people having the uh, the the, doc, the passwords can access it. Yeah, and not ex external malicious people. Then two we can make sure the files are not changed. This means that maintaining the integrity of the files. Now, for this, we can use, there are different tools out there, uh, like Hashcalc and all that. 
which you can use to maintain the integrity to see if has someone modified my excel has someone modified this like maybe you have the student records grades you're just fresh from grading the people then how will you know that if someone has come to your file and just edited the grades or whatever so yeah there is tools which you can use to monitor that like hashcal and for this session we will go to a practical session just after this to dive more into that aspect then also as an advisory it is just good to have up to date software because with the these new softwares we need to with the new patches and new updates they come with higher security measures which can help you in protecting your data so like if you have a say an antivirus or you're using a tool such as telegram and you've not updated it or zoom you need to update it such that like something like zoom if you've not updated it and you're using an older version you could be susceptible to zoom bombing this will be like people joining your zoom call and they could even expose your students to not so not things which are not of course viewable to the students and which will be terrible then last but not least hiring the IT experts to test and implement security measures now this means that you in as in yourself you are confident in your security measures but it is always advisable to hire external vendors reputable vendors to come then test and implement security measures they will come and advise you on where you might have not you might have been overlooked and every everywhere where you you might not be sure they will come and help you with that because this is something they've been in the industry so they know the ups and downs and the pitfalls of every of most things but it is always just a form of just keeping vigilant and staying on your feet and on your toes now for this part as for earlier as we spoken on it we we'll, we're going to dive more into the presentations basically this will be how to secure the your files and yeah how to make sure they've not been altered to prevent from alteration and also in the event that they are deleted or people have accessed it and you can have no control over them how you can recover the data so yeah, just give me a moment as i switch to the other presentations okay we can start with how to secure your documents everyone can hear me in the chat yeah just how to secure your documents now for this we can use let's start first with this foxit basically this is the tool that i normally use on a day to day so basically what happens is you've opened foxit and you are looking for your pdf so for me i have this like a economics strathmore university notes these are now are your notes you wish to share them maybe with your students or at the fellow educators out there and you want to make some restrictions so what what do you do in this aspect you can just open the notes like this so here they are blah blah, blah all those acknowledgments and all that so this is your document your pdf how can i secure it if i'm sharing with someone how can i know that i'll share with this person and i don't want them to print this paper or i don't want them to copy anything to change anything only read but not alter the content or maybe i want i'm sharing it with people but i want only some few people to have access to it what can we do so basically like this document here you have your notes so you can go to properties then the security aspect yeah so currently you can as you can see here everything is allowed from content copying changing the document feeling someone can change just this document print everything is allowed but now how can we restrict this what we can do is basically 
come here, you can use the password protection, yeah? Here you can see, it shows you like, input your password. So you just come here, you put a password like, let's say, teachers, something, but something, a strong password, of course. <laughs> so yeah, you can encrypt your password here and all that, moving on. Then you see other document restrictions. Uh, after you put your password, you see everything here, printing is allowed, copying is allowed. You can change these permissions right here. Like here you can restrict printing, maybe to none, like not nothing for them to print and all that. So with this, you see, you can share your documents easily with confidence, knowing that there's some security to it and no one can alter uh, all that unless you give them the password or all that or no one can print the data yeah so after all that after you're done you just put don't encrypt and all that then you just save the data but yeah basically this is what you can use to secure your documents now this is for the pdfs but there are also tools out there for the words and excel and all that but yeah this was just an example of how you can secure now the pdf can be something like the results and everything the notes as you've seen the possibilities are endless yeah so yeah this is just basically how you can secure the files now let me show you in the event that let's say you've deleted your files by accident or someone has hacked into your computer and they have deleted your files or someone has accessed it but your files are gone what can you do yeah so there are various data recovery tools out there personally i use the easiest data recovery tool which is here which i'll just show you but what you can do is you can hire an external vendor for this there are reputable companies out there which can help with this but basically you can input let's say it's, you had the notes in your flash drive but it was corrupted what you see is you can input this then you can scan yeah you can just scan the data here and it will just show you it will recover everything which was in that file and which you can now restore it or save it in a separate more stable drive yeah this can also be seen you see this is windows see this is currently this pc you can also restore data which is on this pc but now right now is only that there's nothing to restore here but basically that is what happens when you input a flash drive it will show here and you can just click restore and it will restore it so that is how you can recover the data maybe it can be the examination results or the questions and answers marking scheme and all that now finally i'd just like to show to sensitize you on another one called hashcal basically as we said before on digital security how will you know that let's say you you have a you have your own file there it is something like the grades you've graded your students how will you know that these students haven't changed? Someone hasn't come to your computer and changed something on your document, yeah? How can you trust that this is the same document that you shared? Now for this, uh, I can give you, this is HashCalc, SlavaSoft HashCalc. You, you can find it in the internet. So for this, you can use this. Let's say this is a document. Let me just open it. We can say like, this topic three to five, you open and you calculate. Now, this is the hash. You can see it starts with six, D, C, F, nine, all that. This is basically the hash. You can take a screenshot of it or something. So this document 3.5, if this is the hash, hash basically is what identifies a document or something. We use hashes. So this is it hash. If you change any aspect of the document, the hashes also change. So we can just test that the, the topic three to five, we can open it and 
I can just I hope you are seeing it. Let me just share my screen. Now here is the topic three to five, all that, your data, it could be the grades, it could be anything. Notes. So let's say someone comes and changes this, something like that. You can now save this. Yeah. Let us save control S. We've changed something there in the document. You remember the previous one? It started 61 DC. Of which we'll just confirm. After saving, we can close it. Let me just share my screen again. Then open the hash calc. You remember initially it was like this 6DC984. That is the document. This is the hash of it. We can go again and check after editing we open calculate the hash you see it has changed it starts with b7 a5 now this is just a clear indication that your document has been altered and from there at least you can see that uh, you can protect yourself and see that maybe these are not valid results or valid the document and basically nowadays microsoft it has like a version control so for the documents, let's say you can just pick an older version, say from yesternight, where you're confident that that had every, the data that which you wanted and use that instead. So yeah, basically that's how it happens. That's how you can protect your data and how you can recover your data and also how you can just check that your data has not been altered or uh, tampered with in any way. Now, for the final part of this, will be just the key takeaways. There are a lot of things, as we've mentioned before, just a quick recap. There's the physical security, the administration security, or administrative security, operational security, and the, yeah, which for the day-to-day, -day, and also the physical and the digital security, yeah, physical, operational, digital, and administrative. Now, we need to factor in all that in well securing our data to make sure like the teacher data, student data, everything is secure. So firstly, as we've mentioned, you need to update your systems regularly. General updates will make sure at least you are covered from some common non-security attacks such that uh, intruders cannot like attack you with the non with the non like non aspects of security or pitfalls, maintain good password management, make sure you encrypt your data, make secure your data and, uh, with good passwords. You can use, a, as mentioned earlier, you can use a password manager. Use file integrity apps, proper file integrity apps. This basically means that something like the hash calc, to check if the integrity of the file is there or fox it to make sure like the you've put the security controls in place for your files. Then for the educators, you need to spread awareness and conduct regular trainings. Basically, this would be for the teachers, internal and external. Make sure this training should cover both the teachers and the non-teaching staff and the students, such that everyone is aware, even the parents, if it is possible, because it is a joint effort to protect everything and need to create a plan to recover data basically once it is compromised basically this is a business continuity plan you can use the data recovery tools you can maybe use backups which i highly re re recommend secure backups like in a cloud which is secure no one has access to it other than you and backed up regularly or use the data recovery tools to recover the data which you don't you've lost then lastly you need to develop strong guidelines this cyber security and data protection you need these guidelines basically will be in form of policies such that there should be policies in place so uh, to ma maintain the security of the data the policies should cover both the third parties how the students the teachers non-teachers all that everyone should interact on a day to day. So yeah, basically this brings me to the end of my presentation. 
and I'll hand it over to my fellow presenters, to Patricia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chitala. We really appreciated your presentation. Uh, as you can see from the chat, uh, the participants also really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, and before I get to them, yes, we will share the lecture materials. We'll share the presenter's uh, presentation. We will share the recording as well and a Q&A if we are not able to cover all the questions. Uh, so just to get into the questions, um, there's a question on what is metadata. I found it on the chat, uh, so it was answered there, but I'm sure there are a couple of participants who did not uh, see it. So maybe you could just uh, get into what metadata is. Okay. Now, as mentioned earlier, data first refers to the information that is processed or ready for processing. Information that is earlier processed and ready for processing. Now, data, data uh, for the data, it ranges from everything, everything that gives information. This light, this content, uh, the book you're reading, that is all data. Now, the metadata for the classroom will refer to mainly the specific like things like the report cards and the grades and all that, the names, referring mainly to that topic or that area of expertise. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe you could also recap uh, some of the tools that you used during your presentation. Uh, there was a question for the name of the tool for the PDF security and also the tool that you used to get the hash of the document. Oh, sorry for that, but for the for the PDF security, let me start with them. I used Foxit, F-O-X-I-T. Foxit will help you secure your PDFs and all that. For the data recovery tool, I used EaseUS data recovery tool. That is E-A-S-E-U-S data recovery tool. And for the checking the hashes, it is called just hash calc, exactly as I have said it. But I've seen someone saying to write in chat. We'll write it in the chat. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe one of the other facilitators could uh, write that in the chat as we continue the Q&A. Uh, yeah. The other question is on, can you recover data from a formatted system? Yes, you can. So basically, just a quick introduction to data. data well, computing data is basically just ones and zeros. So when something is formatted or deleted, it's not that it disappears forever. Like it's just realignment of that ones and zeros. So for the data, as long as the data storage tool, maybe the flash drive or the hard disk or the whatever it is, the computer is still intact, you can recover that data, of course. So that is just basically, yeah, you can recover the data, any data, yeah. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, and now on to the questions that were in the Q&A. Uh, so there's a question from Alice uh, who says, uh, we are using Zoom. Have we been protected from Zoom bombing? And I think I can take that. Um, as you may have noticed, you have to register for, you do have to register for all our webinars. Uh, so the link is not shareable because then you you register and then it is shared to your, um, to your email and only you can use it. And we have a passcode as well when you're joining. Uh, so you have to use the passcode to join uh, the webinar. We do not share the webinar publicly. We only share it through, um, the official communication channels uh, you're not able to access the the link from anywhere else other than the communication channels that are the facilitators we've set up so that is through email and uh through the telegram group that we have created uh, so we have made sure that um to also enable you to have limited uh controls within uh within the 
within the Zoom webinar itself. For example, you are not able to unmute yourself and speak uh, so that in case of anything, someone is not able to disrupt. Uh, you've also seen that there's a, um, there's a distinction between panelists and participants. Uh, again, that is just to segregate the controls that we have. You're also not able to share your screen so that um, we do not have any interruptions in during the webinar. So yes, we have taken the measures to make sure that uh, Zoom bombing does not happen. And if it does, then the person is not able to disrupt our um, our webinar because that is the biggest fear of zoom bombing disruption of the webinar or sharing of uh, very uh, obscene content so we've made sure that no one just no one is able to share it without our uh, authorization uh, there's a question on is foxit open source or free maybe you could take that Bethan. yeah yeah so for Foxit, uh, you need to like this the trial version, but I would recommend you use the paid version because that is more secure and it that is more secure and it has more, let's say, security features and controls which you can use to secure your data. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is again on zoom webinars and recordings um how can we secure the classroom recordings when it is through zoom or google meet or teams would you like to take that and then i can complement yeah. your answer <laughs> yeah no problem as patricia said earlier for things like zoom the, the security controls you need you as the educator you need to put in place now Things like not everyone can unmute themselves, not everyone can share the screens unless given permissions. That is all part of the securing. And you need to, as you notice, register before coming into the session. That is something like for Zoom. For Microsoft Teams, I find it is much easier and more adaptive. It has security features quite similar to Zoom. You can also restrict the people who enter the meeting you see like when you join a meeting you need to admit the person now unless the you know the person or it is from someone you had invited you can choose not to invite the person there's an option for not presenting a screen for attendees unless you personally as the person who created the link allows it and all that but there are various security measures put in place which you can do that and yeah but mainly all i can say is first and foremost you, there's just the simple things you need to do like only use the like if you are setting up a meeting just share it with the official student emails or student contacts not outside that and while you're sharing it also ensure it is on a if the institution has a platform ensure it is based on that and not personal but if it is personal you can just put some added security measures to ensure you're you're safe and the student data is safe and all the data so yeah over to you patricia uh, thank you bethel um i could also add that uh, there are also provisions for recordings to ha to require a password uh, so you could also do that so that um, the person, everyone that you share this recording with would have to um, input the password that you shared for them to um, access the recording. So if they do not have the password, then they're not able to access those recordings. I would advise that for especially very sensitive um, recordings, if um, a recording shares any sensitive information or or it's, it showcases your students' uh, names, that anything that could be sensitive and you would not want to get out there, that is something that you could have a password on and make sure that um, everyone who is a to access the recordings. Uh, someone in the chat asked, what if a link, the link to the webinars is shared by us um, and even the password 
So that is why for us, we, we cannot always trust the end user to do what is required of them. Sometimes you will say that, uh, please don't share the don't share the link, don't do this, don't do that. But then that is not done. So that is why we have those access controls just to make sure that in case you actually shared it with with someone else and they came in and they would want to disrupt the session, then we have controls to make sure that that does not happen. So you do not, uh, that Zoom bomber is not going to affect us. So that is why we have those controls not to share screen, not to unmute yourself. Um, those controls us to help us in case of such a thing happens. So that is why even when you're setting your own Zoom calls and webinars, please make sure that um, you check all the settings as you are um, sharing the link just to make sure that whoever joins, they are able to, you're able to control who joins. So just be careful around that. Um, the reason why for us, for example, we do not have a waiting room is because we have really large numbers of participants and admitting everyone each, um, everyone one by one would be very cumbersome. Uh, but in smaller meetings, we would advise for you to have a waiting room where you admit each person that comes because, for example, in a class setup, you know your students. So you know who is coming in. So you're able to admit them easily instead of uh, just letting them come in the way they would want. And then uh, that is how uh, Zoom bombers would also gain access to your to your class. Uh, there's a question around Hashcalc. Um, how did you open it? Um, I believe I can easily take that. Um, that it's something you have to install and then you you literally double click on it and use it. Um, so that is generally how you would use Hashcalc. So just search for it, um, install it to your machine, and then you'll be able to actually interact with it. Also, we'll share this recording and you'll also be able to maybe skip to the part where Mr. Chitala does the does the uh, presentations or rather the demos, and you'll be able to see step by step what uh, he was able to do during the uh, during the webinar. Uh, there's a question on how best do you protect employees from social engineering? Would you like to take that? Uh, yes, yes. Now, <laughs> social engineering, you know, as you, okay, basically the people, the human factor is the weakest link in the cyber security, in cyber security. So, Many people fall prey to social engineering. Now, for the employees, whether it is the teachers, non-teaching staff, any, anyone really in the organization or in the institution, what you can do is first and foremost, have regular training and awareness. Basically, this would sensitize them to make sure like they're always on their toes and they know what to look for. Ensure like everyone secures their data and they're, they're just aware of the key security, basic security practices, best security practice, like don't share your password with someone else. When you're typing a password, make sure it is secret, make sure you change it regularly. Things like, uh, basically with social engineering, the attacker mainly aims to get information from someone in which they can use maliciously. So. You just make sure like for those information you keep them secure and with this you know with the current generation people forget human is to err people make mistakes so you just need to sensitize it regularly if it is possible organize some drills to just keep people on their toes to make you see like you clicked on this email phishing email or something and you're not supposed to and just make sure it is as informative as possible not nothing for punishment or all that such that people are have a safe environment and know what to look for and what is expected from them but if there's anything you can add patricia i believe you you answered as well and um i think just one thing uh techniques are always changing so it's important to also kind of keep on familiarizing yourself with uh different social engineering techniques that are coming up 
Uh, this could be again through continuous uh, training and education uh, so that you're always in the know of what is happening, especially in your industry. So for example, uh, when it comes to learning inst institutions, you could uh, regularly check um, any new attacks. It could be as simple as um, searching online and googling and uh, and researching and you'll be able to receive a lot of information around uh, new case studies that are happening uh, new attacks that have happened and then that is how you continuously learn how to protect yourself so it's not a one-time thing just because you've taken advanced cybersecurity training for teachers doesn't mean now you're fully fully uh, acclimatized with security you have to continue you have to continue having these discussions even with your students uh, because it's a conversation it's a continuous thing so that um, we get that security mindset that uh, Chitala spoke about uh, there's a question on uh, are there any alternatives to Foxit yes there are you can use I believe the most common one which easily accessible would be the Adobe Adobe Acrobat Reader Pro or PDF Reader Pro. The, the, I'm sure you've all used Adobe Acrobat Reader, but the Pro version can, it has also some of those security measures. Or you have something like Wondershare PDF element. Those also can help you with securing your PDFs and all that. But personally, I found that Fox, Fox, it was, it had a better user interface and all that, but you're free to use any of them. All those Adobe Acrobat Reader, I can also recommend that they're all very good software. And while I'm saying this, I'm also referring to the, the pro version, the business version. This one, you have, you need to pay for it you can of course you can use the free one but it has less security features but the paid one it is usually very very helpful so yeah all right uh thank you thank you for that answer um i think it is important to note that a lot of these tools for some of them you would need to pay to receive the advanced features um so for the freemium uh, portion of the application you'll only be able to do so much uh, so if you really really do need something uh, you may need to pay for it or keep on researching for other free alternatives to do it uh, for example i saw a question on um uh is us um there's someone who used it there's a there's a there's an activity we have in the course to recover um a deleted document um, and someone said that they failed because uh, it suggested to to buy keys to succeed to restore my data. Is there there is US program for free? And um, since we're the ones who provided that activity, I think I can take this. Um, I think somewhere in the in the course notes, we noted that some of these tools you would need to pay for to fully recover uh, your documents because they will have paywalls so you'll only be able to maybe for example preview as in the case of EasyUS, you're only able to preview uh, your document but not actually save it and so um, I would say when it, came, when it comes to data recovery it's very important to have data backups so that in case of such a situation you're able to actually just restore the backup and you're able to move on for example if um, if you do not have backups of your, let's say, academic records, and God forbid, you have a situation where your laptop fails and your disk is uh, corrupted and you're not able to uh, restore those documents. And recovering the documents would take a lot of time. It would be time consuming. That would mean that um, you would lose those documents or you would have to pay a lot of money to actually have them recovered. So it's very important to have data backups uh, just to make sure that in case of such circumstances, you're able to restore your data. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and since we are running out of time, um, I think we will end the Q&A there because uh, there are a few things, housekeeping things would like to discuss with uh, the participants, just to let them know of their progress. 
and um, also about the webinar timings. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chitala. I will just share a bit more details about um, this week's certification tracking, just to make sure that everyone knows what um, is expected of them and to receive certificate of completion or uh, the certificate of participation. So I'll just quickly share my screen. Right, um, as you can see on your screen, um, we're already done with week one. So you have completed all those things and I'm, I'm sure everyone wants a certificate. Uh, so I'm sure you made sure to uh, look at your test scores to make sure that you have at least 60% for the certificate of completion and at least 50% for the certificate of uh, participation. So for week two, we, had, um, we have four activities. And so you need to have completed at least two of those activities. And um, an activity is considered complete once you have responded to that specific activity forum. So once you respond, it will uh, reflect in your progress to the, as the forums that you've contributed to. So please check your progress to make sure that you, you can see that you've contributed to these uh, specific activities. Would advise for you to do all of them uh, but for the certification criteria, you, you need to have done at least two. Uh, we have two quizzes. So we have uh, the data access control quiz and then the module assessment. So to get a certificate of completion, you need to score at least 60% in both of these quizzes. And when I say in both, it means that if you score less than 60%, uh, then you will not be able to get that certificate. For the certificate of participation, you need to score at least 50% in both of those quizzes. So as you can see, for each of the quiz in, these, in this course, you need to score at least above 50% for you to receive a certificate. So please just go back to your profile and check whether you have attained these scores. And if you haven't, um, please retake them because you're actually able to um, attempt the quizzes as many times as you would want and would want for you to get um, a certificate at the end of this course. That is why we are doing this certification tracking. So check your profile. You will be able to see your test results for all the, uh, for all the quizzes and also for the forums that you've contributed to. I know a lot of you are also having challenges with, uh, with, the, with your progress uh, reflecting on the on the app or on the website, um, especially for some videos or uh, some articles, you read them and it still doesn't show 100%. Uh, good thing is that is not counted towards the certification, so you will still be able to get your certificate. But please make sure you go through the course content because the purpose of this course is for us to learn as much as we can. So please go through them, go through all the activities, attempt, attempt all these things so that um, you're not left behind and all this content you're able to consume it and learn a lot about cybersecurity. Uh, the other thing is that we've noticed um, a lot of you struggling with uh, the webinar time conversions. So all our webinars are at 4 p.m. GMT. And so you have to convert that to your local time zone so that you know what time the webinar is at. Uh, so we would like to show you just one of the tools you can use to convert this time. All right. Um, so when, when you look at, the, at this time converter, you're able to add different time zones and then compare it. So as I've mentioned, our our webinars will share the time in GMT. And say, for example, um, you are in what time zone? Uh, let's say the East African time zone. So I can add East Africa, the East African time zone. And then as you can see, you're able to see a comparison of the two. So I'll, I'll come in here and I will change it to 4 p.m., which is the time that uh, we usually share uh, for the time zone. And as you can see, it converts it to your current time zone. You can add as many time zones as you would want. Um, and that will be able to convert for you the time that uh, the webinar will be at. 
So just add your time zone there or even your city or town. Um, for example, if you're if you're in India, sorry, um, if I'm in India, uh, whichever, let's say in Delhi, if I add that, I will be able to compare it with my 4 p.m. 4 p.m. GMT, and then you get the time for that. Uh, you get the time for the specific time that uh, the webinar will be at. So if you if you're in Delhi, India, um, the webinar will be at 9:30 p.m. So please use this uh, tool. There are very many time converters. You can just search for it time converter, time zone converter, and you'll be able to uh, use one to convert the time. Uh, but don't worry if if that is still um, challenging you, you can still post in the Telegram group and we'll be able to tell you what time the webinar will be at. Uh, but we would want for you to be as self-sustaining as possible, just to make sure that you know how to convert uh, through the different time zones. So again, thank you very much for uh, being here today and uh, participating in the webinar for sharing, um, for answering the questions of um, our guest speaker in the chat. Thank you for participating. And with that, I would say uh, we're coming to the end of the webinar. I would love to thank our, our guest speaker today. Um, I believe we all share the same sentiments that he showed us um, how to protect our documents and our data. And I believe everyone found it useful and you found tools that you can also use in your own um, in your own work, in your own learning institution as well. So thank you very much, Mr. Chitala. Thank you to the rest of the facilitators for being here. Um, and thank you to you participants for showing up today and participating and um, staying to the very end. So thank you very much. Have yourself a lovely rest of your day.